name's Mark. Uh, uh, I'm David Zierden, and in my uh, role as state climatologist, a, a big part of my job is communicating and presenting to the general public or uh, non-scientists, if you will. And I used to think I was pretty good at it. Uh, that was until I invited my wife the first time at one of my presentations. I remember it well. It was a science cafe at a quirky little pub in Midtown called Waterworks. And I get about five minutes into my presentation, and I look back, and she's just buried in her pub. And after, after it, she, she told me, you're well-spoken, you clearly know your material very well, but all those graphs and maps, I just got lost. And she was 100% right. So kind of opened my eyes to kind of do a little, take a little better approach. So why is communicating to the public uh, important? Well, for one, the, our funding agencies are putting more and more emphasis on outreach and education. And if you have a strong outreach and education component, you're more likely to win the proposal. Uh, also, we've all been in scientific conferences where you sit through one dry presentation after another. Then all of a sudden, someone comes up who grabs your attention, you can understand their material clearly, and you really feel like you've got something out of their talk. And I bet they use a lot of the same tips and uh, skills that I'm going to show you today. Uh, one other thing, uh, I would propose that as in my field, climate science, we haven't done a good job at communicating to the public. And as evidence, when some of the best known spokesmen are a former vice president, Academy Award winner, finally, uh, <laughs> or a children's TV show host. Uh, I'd say that we as scientists aren't doing a great job. Even astrophysics, they have uh, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Carl Sagan, uh, real scientists that they're supposed to be. Uh, the, the, main, the main point, uh, you have to know what your audience is there for. What do they want to hear? Certainly they want to hear the science or the information you're going to give. But I think too much as scientists we have this mindset that the data or the results will speak for themselves. And we really have to change that mindset. The audience is there to learn about you, your expertise, your experiences, your stories most importantly. And as an illustration, here's Dr. Chassinet presenting at a middle school. And you can't really see what he's presenting, but it says, what does an oceanographer do? He's talking about himself, his career, the tools that he uses, not showing some kind of hard science. And everyone's really engaged. The audience also wants to know about themselves. Why is this important to me? How does this impact my life? And again, here's another great example from, uh, from Dr. Chastanet, where he's uh, sampling on the beach, so in conjunction with the oil spill work. But everyone values the beaches and our pristine coastline, so it's, um, it's important to them. Uh, one last example, uh, just as an example, if I'm going to talk about climate change and the increasing frequency of uh, extreme rainfall, Instead of showing a map or a graph or, graph or analysis, I tell the story of Kirk Brock, who farms 5,000 acres in the next county over, and how he's uh, innovating and using high-density cover crops to make his operation more resilient from these uh, heavy rainfall events. So why is it important to us and our neighbors? That's really catches the audience. As scientists, we're, we're trained well in traditional peer-to-peer -peer communication. And the, the usual avenues are uh, publications and referee journals and presentations at scientific uh, conferences and workshops. And this is great. This is necessary. This is how you build your career, build your CV, uh, gain promotion and tenure. But it's a not very effective way of reaching the general public. Now, I'm gonna, what we gotta do uh, is kind of to flip the approach. Oh, and let me go back. Let me go back. A couple other comments. 
in our uh, in our journal articles, Dr. O'Brien used to say that 90% of the people that look at your journal article don't read it. They'll read the abstract and then go straight to the figures. So you got to have your abstract tight and make sure it hammers home your main results and main points. And your figures, the captions, have to be self-explanatory. You shouldn't have to go into the text to figure out what's in the figure. And then our, our presentations, they always follow this kind of outline, uh, background, data, methods, results, and conclusions. And then you see a lot of slides that look something like that. Well, in communicating with the public, you have to flip that approach and uh, approach it more like a journalist would. Uh, journalists know that, that the audience will decide whether they want to read the article further or not in the first few sentences or first paragraph. So you've got to get the bottom line, the main point, right from the start, then explain why is it important, then you can fill in the supporting details. So the next few slides, I'm going to talk about oral presentations and how we can do a better job with those, especially in a non-scientific audience. Uh, here's a challenge. Consider ditching the PowerPoint approach. Here's what one of the most dynamic speakers of our age has to say about PowerPoint, Steve Jobs, with or without. Uh, in fact, the story. I remember Jim O'Brien, he was a very engaging speaker. One of the best presentations I saw him do was at the physics department on campus. And this was kind of before PowerPoint technology. The IT staff took a whole silicon graphics computer over so that he could show these fancy animations of the, of the ocean. Well, of course it didn't work. And he had to give the whole presentation, about a 30 minute presentation, just orally. And you could everyone was glued to him the whole time one of the best presentations i saw so i just challenge try to try it if the setting is right try it without any powerpoint slides but if you must do powerpoint here's some of the cardinal sins and i'm not picking on anybody because i've done these exact same things before uh, never any reason to show equations to uh, to a non-scientific audience few reasons in a scientific setting, but no reason at all in a non-scientific audience. Uh, some comments on graphics that you must show them. Uh, this thing is only one quantity per graph. Uh, this one's not too bad. It's the, the y-axis is depth. That's pretty self-explanatory. But there are three different x-axes, which just adds confusion. And again, we're trying publication costs are high and we're trained to pack as much information into one graphic as we can, but that doesn't work well for the general public. These multiple uh, plate ones sort of lose, lose the audience very quickly. And this is just a personal bias. I hate plate charts. I can't follow them at, at, in any setting, so that's just my own personal bias. Some other PowerPoint do's and don'ts. Uh, less text better and certainly don't do the page after page and bullet points. If you can do bullet points, you can just say it verbally. Uh, graphics and maps should fill up the whole page and then be very simple and then labeled very clearly and I'll give an example of that next. Uh, Got to explain the graphics thoroughly but if they're done right, they kind of stand alone also. And of course we got to eliminate jargon and any acronyms. Uh, I, I talk frequently about the El Nino La Nina cycle, but I never say the word and so because people aren't as familiar and they get lost. So I always say it out that El Nino La Nina cycle and they can follow a lot better. Um, I don't like animations or text flying in or fading in and out. That's unnecessary and distracting. And this is not a guideline no more than one slide per minute, ever. And less is even better than that. And take, take for me, I've violated this many, many times and it never works. And now, here's an example of, if you're gonna show a graph uh, to the public, this is an example of how to do it. 
fills up the page. The axes are clearly labeled in common units. This is uh, an actual date, uh, uh, not day 150 or something. And the, the y-axis parts per million. And also, I begin by telling you about Charles Keeling and how he set up this laboratory on the top of Mount Mount Loa, which gives uh, a personal connection and a history to the data rather than just showing the data. And then the main take-home point from this graph, big and bold right at the top, 407 parts per million per year. I'm going to switch to some other uh, ways of reaching the general public, uh, the traditional media, uh, TV, radio, newspapers, and magazines uh, can be very effective. Uh, but in order to work it correctly, you need to be accessible. Journalists have deadlines. And if you don't call them back immediately or answer the phone when they call, they're going to go to the next person on their Rolodex. And in conjunction with that, that Cultivate your relationships with reporters. Uh, uh, I'm almost on a first name basis with most of the science writers and science editors here in the state of Florida. And also, uh, Dr. Chastanay and Basu and some others do this very effectively. If you have some great results or hosting a big meeting or workshop, consider doing a press release. Uh, FSU Media Relations are always looking for for things like this to put out, and they'll, they're uh, wonderful at helping you. And I'm not so involved, but editorials or columns in a local newspaper can be very effective. Peter Ray used to write a, a weekly column uh, uh, during hurricane, I <laughs> know, during hurricane season, Ryan Couchelet, who now uh, has a, started his own private business, but he was an FSU grad, he did a weekly column on the hurricane season. And there's also books, like uh, the one compiled by the Florida Climate Institute, uh, edited by Dr. Chastanay and Basu, on sort of climate change and variability. Uh, I'm almost out of time, so let me go quickly. Um, Non-conventional media is great, too. I've gotten a lot of mileage out of uh, social media, Facebook, but Twitter, I've made so many contacts in fields like broadcast meteorology, uh, uh, private meteorology that I would have never made uh, just going to conferences. So it's been very good for networking. And I get information pushed to me, journal articles and, and new science that I couldn't have stumbled across otherwise. Uh, something I'd like to explore is uh, podcasts or maybe even YouTube channel. That's the, they're getting a lot more traction than I haven't explored that yet. I've so, got one thing to leave you with. Uh, here's an example of climate communication. And this was a little internet meme done by Ed Mybach, who's uh, the head of the Climate Change Communication Center at George Mason University. He claims you can communicate about climate change in these five simple points. It's real. It's us, the experts agree, it's bad, but there's hope. Now, while I agree in spirit with this, and it's certainly an effective communication tool, some of these are vast uh, oversimplifications, and then also use emotionally charged language like it's bad and there's hope. So I'll just put this up there. I came up with my own communication points. I'll just leave them up here. I want you to read them. That's another talk for another day. Questions for David? Suggestions for how to communicate better? Here. Yeah, I'll, I'll just circulate. I mean, uh, on the corrupt resource, there's a book that I sent put together for all the scientifically speaking. And uh, maybe it's time to recirculate it. Because it raises a lot of the points that they did. I wonder if we should put it on our Google Calendar for annual right. message to go out. Uh, yeah, David, that was uh, quite nice. It's very different talking to uh, politicians, uh, the public, middle schoolers, than it is to scientists. And we were all really good for them. That said, all these things still help with the scientists. 
One other pointer that I have is um, be excited or enthusiastic about your data and your model or methods. If, you, if you're not enthusiastic about it, your audience is going to be. And just an example, instead of saying, I'm using the run from the HICON model. We talked about how HICON is the state of the science and uh, one of the most sophisticated ocean models, how it's different from others, who uses it, uh, how much the Navy relies on it. Be excited about it, and then your audience will be too. Since there you are, it's like, true. People really need it. You know, some of, the, some of the guidelines are, you know, you may not remember, you know, you're violating some of the, some of the rules that you're making for the page. Yeah, it's really good to go back and read these after we talk about the little fixes. Yes. Yeah. I'd like to thank everybody, right. and uh, particularly for them being so enthusiastic in all these talks. That was so important. Thank you.